Joining me today is James Pathakoukas. He is a senior fellow in the DeWitt Wallace Chair at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI, where he analyzes U.S. economic policy, writes and edits the AE Ideas blog, and hosts AEI's political economy podcast. He is also a contributor to CNBC and writes the Faster Please newsletter on Substack, which I am subscribed to. I think the whole Human Progress team is subscribed. You should check it out. He is also a former columnist for both Reuters and the U.S. News and World Report, a Jeopardy champion, and the author of the thought-provoking and very refreshing new book, The Conservative Futurist, which makes the surprising case for how what he calls up-wing thinking can help us achieve the epic sci-fi future of our dreams. Jim, how are you? Ah, I'm excellent. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Very refreshing. I hope the book's refreshing. Uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. So tell me about the book and what inspired it. Well, I think everybody who has a book coming out now, mine comes out October 3rd, can available for pre-order now, They'll say like they were somehow inspired by COVID. It all started during COVID. And uh, I mean, that is true for me. That's when I began writing it, the summer of 2020. But it was a very different book when I began uh, typing away. Originally, I was going to write uh, a book kind of like about our lost future, the future that we didn't get, a sci-fi future that we didn't get, of course, flying cars, but also clean and abundant energy, uh, an orbital economies, you know, space colonies, everyone being like, you know, two to three, four times richer, all that stuff. Why didn't we get it? And why are we sitting here in, you know, summer 2020, like not being able to supply people like with masks or, rep or respirators? Like, why don't we already have a vaccine? All that stuff. So it's going to be like, you know, we just blew it. So it was very negative. But then I started reading these stories like calling America like a failed state and a failed country. I'm like, well, that seems a little much. That seems like that's a, that's a little harsh. I mean, things aren't as good as what they could be nowhere close, but I think that was, that was, that, 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 that was just taking it too far. And then of course, like we developed a vaccine, like in record time. I'm like, well, that's, that's a strange thing for a failed country to do. And then we began seeing, a lot of other interesting things happening. Uh, we saw the emergence, uh, machine learning, obviously, and AI predate uh, the uh, the pandemic. But we, I started seeing more advances there. I started seeing more advances in nuclear energy, nuclear fusion, all these technologies. And I began thinking, hey, like this stuff is all possible. All the stuff they dreamed of back in the '60s, like. It's, we should already have had that. So we should be like 50 years ahead of where we are. So I began thinking hard, like not only what went wrong, but what we can do different today to make that future finally happen and then go far beyond it. So tell me about the title, as you point out in the introduction. It's very counterintuitive. People don't normally think of futurism as something conservative. And by conservative, um, you say that you mean a custodian of the classical liberal tradition in the words of George Will to clarify. So how did you come up with the title? Yeah, it, it does sound like an oxymoron, you know, like the classic one was like mil military intelligence. Like, you know, it's a real, uh, you know, kind of like uh, man bites dog kind of thing. Those things don't go together. But I kind of think they do. I also wouldn't have written the book that, you know, part of how I view conservatism is sort of preserving what is best, preserving the best parts of our inheritance, which I view as liberal democracy, market cap uh, capitalism. And that's like a sacred, re sacred responsibility to be able to preserve that, work to make it better, and then hand it off to the future generations. I mean, you know, the classic Edmund Burke quote that there's this connection between the past, the present, and the future. So for me, to be a conservative is to inherently think about what kind of world we're going to uh, you know, leave our, our children and our, and our, and our great grandchildren. So to me, there's nothing, you know, there's nothing, uh, you know, contrary about it. to me. It, it, that's what, that's what we should be thinking about. It's not what people, a lot of people think of today where it's, 
you know, uh, nostalgia for the 1950s, uh, nostalgia for like, oh, if, you know, everyone should be working at a factory. And it's kind of economic nostalgia that we've seen over the past years. It's something very different. It's really using all these fantastic tools that we've developed to creating a better world, not just in the United States. So obviously, you know, I'm an American and I want the U.S. to be a, you know, richer, more technologically advanced, but the whole world. You know, raising poverty. To me, there's nothing more conservative futurist than bringing people out of poverty, enabling them to have the kind of future they want to build. Like, that's that's my kind of consumer, conservative futurism. Oh, and by the way, if we have more people in the world who are who are reaching their potential as they see it, that's going to be that's good for all of us. So that that's. That's the kind of vision I'm trying and optimism I hope I can get I can get across through the book. So you're using conservative in the sense of classical liberal, pro-innovation, pro-free market, all of those things. But there's another term that you use far more often in the book than conservative, which is upwing. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, obviously it's a play on, you know, left wing and right wing. I didn't come up with the uh, I didn't come up with the term. But it sort of stuck with me. And to me, if you think about like the, the, you know, you've probably taken an online survey, like where, where do your politics fall on this spectrum? And it'll be left and right, you know, how far left, how far right? Well, that to me, the, the idea of upwing is to sort of transcend those sort of classifications. And to me, if you want a better tomorrow, if you think we have the agency and the tools and the will to create the better tomorrow that we want, that we sort of all want organically, not necessarily that somebody in Washington wants to create, but that we can begin to create that future for ourselves. Again, you could be, you know, a Democrat, Republican, left of center, all that stuff. To me, that is upwing. Upwing is seeing the the potential of humanity and then working to achieve it. And I think that, you know, I, I may be the right of center, but there's people left of center who want to do that too. Uh, you know, people left and right, you know, think, gosh, you know, it's been a big waste that we don't have nuclear power. And now we're worried about not having enough energy uh, to run our AI models. And we have to have, you know, shortages. Like, you don't, that is not a left or right issue. To me, that is an up versus downwing issue. People who want, who want to go backwards, people who worry, who want a world that is, that is, that is poor, so we don't use up the earth. People tell people who are in poor countries, you can never get as rich as we are in the West. That can't happen. That is a false dream. Those are those are downwing people. And I hope people who are on the traditional left and right reject that vision. Though I see a lot of that vision, unfortunately, all around. So this book, despite the title, it's not really aimed at the right. Um, it's something that I think could appeal to center right, center left people, moderates, libertarians, classical liberals of all stripes. And you describe America as the original upwing nation. Tell me, what sort of characteristics would you say define an upwing nation? And does that also imply that there can be downwing nations? And what advice would you have to someone who fears they may be living in one of those? Well, I, I fear that there's too much of that. I think all nations have those elements all sort of listen if you're if you're a rich country then you have mostly embraced a more upwing vision but you have downwing elements and of course my concern is that too much of that downwing stuff has been dominant in the united states and many western countries uh over the past few decades and what i and i think the key characteristics of an upwing country of course any country that begins at, with you know Three million people on the windy North Atlantic coast, you know, clinging to the edge of <laughs> edge, the edge of survival to become a continent-spanning global superpower. They're, they're doing something right, and that right isn't just policy, though. There's there's plenty of policy in the book, but it's also an attitude. And there's a great there's a great quote where how is it when we when we have nothing, we've seen nothing but progress in reality. Do we somehow think, well, th we're not going to have that anymore? We're only going to have, we're only going to have pessimism and failure ahead. That, that that hasn't been that hasn't been our history. Our history has been constant improvement. Yet today, too often, we seem to be telling ourselves 
Well, that that needs to stop. We can't have that. Uh, we there's not enough earth to have that. Uh, we don't know how to do it. We 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 shouldn't be we should be preparing our children for uh, lower living standards, less opportunity. Uh, it was interesting that I saw this floating around uh, the internet. Uh, this quote from um, um, oh, uh, uh, what's his name? Ah, I'm a die. I'm I'm dying here. Take your time. Oh, uh, Hunter F. Thompson. You know, well known for sort of the fear and loathing. Uh, c- continued to have fear and loathing about the future of America back then. Um, but it was a quote from 2001, and the, the idea that we need to be, we had to begin to uh, prepare people, our children, for 20 years of of decline and beyond that further decline and that 9-11 marked the end of everything and we our children would never live our lives well that, you know, that didn't happen like there's a lot of things went wrong we had war we had financial crisis yet people are better off today than they were in 2001 again we've seen nothing but progress yet we somehow believe it won't continue uh and really the point of my book is uh, we have seen progress, but boy, we could be doing so much better. We could be so much better, and we shouldn't settle. We shouldn't settle for what that this is the best possible world, and we, and and that it may slip away from us in any second. And you delve into that history with uh, you know, four chapters, which you call the false startup, uh, the false start of Upwing 1.0, the false start of Upwing 2.0, and then two yeah. chapters exploring the mystery of the great downshift. Now, there's a lot in those chapters, but could oh. you give a sort of overview of some of that history? Well, the, the first the first period, which I call the first like Upwing period, where there was where there was not just economic progress, so it wasn't just line go up numbers, but there was also a broad attitude that you know, we can kind of do anything and we can create a better future. Uh, so that that first period is really in those first two decades after World War II. I, I put somewhat arbitrarily actual dates on those of 1955 to 1973. And uh, the reason I picked 1955, uh, that was the opening of Disney World and Tomorrowland. You know, I love that. Uh, so I, I read a lot, I read a lot about Tomorrowland and sort of that that sort of the attitude that was embodied. Also in '55 we had the, really the being of the space race, a cure for polio. Uh, we started seeing a lot more kind of like science, like positive science fiction in 1955. And the end, I almost made the end 1972 because that's when the, the Apollo program ended. But I picked 1973 for kind of a wonky reason because that ended two decades of very strong economic productivity growth, growth uh, which we've never seen that kind of long period of productivity growth since. So that first period, very bullish, fast growth, even more important, like a very upwing pro-growth culture. I mean, you saw that in like movies. You saw, it, you know, Star Trek being the classic example, uh, you know, 2001 Space Odyssey. Also, I, I, I find to be a very fundamentally uh, optimistic film. Uh, and you had a lot of uh, he had intellectuals back then. It seems hard to believe not, but he had these kind of futuristic intellectuals like Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov uh, and and Herman Kahn, who I read about a lot in this book, who thought the future would be much better and focused on trying to predict that future, talk about how to make that. And that, I mean, that was like the prevailing intellectual milieu back then was being positive about the future. And then that ended. <laughs> and, then that, and then that ended. I'll, I'll, I'll mention why it ended. And of course, the more recent period, I, I call the, the late 90s as an upwing period. Internet boom, economy going crazy. Really, maybe the last period of really of real economic progress and like really pure optimism, I think, that most people can remember. And if you're young enough, then like you've never experienced it. Well, so why did that end? Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, that's what I was going to ask you. Well, why did that end? Where does this more negative view of technology come from? How did we go from that optimistic view of the future to, you know, Black Mirror and a science fiction that seems much more negative and just a more negative view of the future in general? Yeah, it's 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 hard to believe that. Like it used to be, it was it was hard to find negative science fiction. Now it's just the opposite. It's so rare to find sort of positive science fiction. I read a lot about science fiction in the book because I think it. 
it plays a key role in sort of helping us imagine the possibility of what a better future might look like. Listen, I, I, I mean, I certainly make the economic case. Uh, if you have a bad economy, a slowing economy, it's tougher to be positive. And, and one reason we had this economic slowdown, which began the early 1970s, were sort of things that may have happened no matter what we did initially. Um, we had all these great inventions of the Industrial Revolution, which really boosted productivity, everything from electrification, uh, of factories, to the combustion engine, the chemical industry. And we seem to have like e extracted all the big productivity gains from those technologies. Uh, so that was going to happen. Um, but what did have to happen was like our response. So a big part of what I try to write about is we have a choice to play. We are not just, you know, victims of fate. Uh, we can do things. And I think two obvious things that we really stopped doing, which given that other technological slowdown is really important that we do, was one, uh, continue to fund basic science at levels that we saw during the space program. So that's, that, that's like one basic thing that government should do, which is, fun, basic science. And the other one, we just regulated it. We regulated uh, Upwing 1.0 away. I, I think it's even, I, I don't think it's even a, a truly debatable point that from, an, that, and I, and I went in this book not wanting to blame environmentalists because I, because I, I, I think there is a kind of environmentalism, which is good. But when we made it very difficult to build things in this country, when we created this caution about technological progress, through actual environmental laws, which then which then began seeping into the culture as well. And you suddenly saw all this negativity about, about the future, that it was going to be a, a poor future. You had these limit the, the book Limits to Growth came out. You had Silent Spring. You had this confluence of factors, which you know really created this, this notion. That it was it was silly. It was silly to think that somehow the future would be better. Uh, and unfortunately, there's that is basically, I think, we where we still are, where we think that the future will be one of poor, volatile climate, uh, more poverty, more inequality. I remember talking with someone, uh, you know, uh, you know, somebody in their 20s about this. Because I was making the case as I do in this book, tomorrow can be richer, it can be funner, it can be cooler. All those dreams that we saw you know, from the Jetsons, like that's all kind of actually possible. She's like, you're telling me exactly the opposite of what I am told every day, which is tomorrow is going to be worse and we are just going to have to swallow it and and just take it. But that That's not the case at all. So do you see the degrowth uh, mindset that's very popular today as a direct descendant then of that change in the 1970s when suddenly these great big new ideas became harder to find and the regulatory environment changed and entrepreneurs weren't able to implement their ideas? It's so funny to hear the same kind of language and the same kind of ideas today that you heard 50 years ago talk about stagnation there is sort of an idea stagnation where you had a certain point of view that just froze it froze about 1972 and has not changed so so you had this sort of you can imagine an environmental movement that wants cleaner air, which is great. We should have cleaner air. That's like a really important thing. That doesn't want lead in our gasoline. The, and the reason that it does that was so that we are healthier. We are happier. Our brains work better. Uh, one can imagine that kind of environment. But the environmentalism we got was not to help people, but that we were kind of like the problem, that we were the problem on this planet. So it became an environmentalism in which we were – which is not primary for our benefit, but was for a different kind of benefit for, for the planet's benefit. And yeah, I mean, so, you know, that really started you know, a lot of fears about radiation, which, which turned into the sort of the anti-nuclear craze. Um, you had people who were sort of had a problem with capitalism. 
uh, only saw it as like a consu- kind of this consumerist conspiracy to like strip the planet. Uh, a lot of these views sort of came together, uh, you know, in the Vietnam War, which they saw as a perfect example of U.S. techno capitalism run amok. And they saw it all as and I I use a phrase by one um, technological scholar from back then, this guy, Lewis Mumford, who called it the mega machine, that there was this mega machine of the military and science and corporate America that was not only ruining this country through war, but would eventually ruin the planet. And you see a lot of those exact same ideas today with people who they don't like big tech. They don't like the university system. They don't like, you know, they they, they fear science. Why can't we go back to a simpler America? Why can't we go? Why can't we go to a back back to an America that's less urban? Uh, they don't like they don't like self driving cars because it's, it's that's that's not the America of the nineteen fifties that they that they that they would love to have back. So those, so that view is just re manifested itself in this degrowth degrowth movement, which remember isn't just about. Um, Preserving, it's not just preserving our way of life, but it's about radically changing our our way of life, saying that not only can we never have poor people live like Americans, Americans can't live like Americans, that we all must settle for something different. We must must settle for a, a greater equality of income throughout the entire planet in order to save the planet. I'm saying something very different. I'm I'm saying, first of all, that is a pessimistic message, which beyond the fringes of social media is not going to, I think, gain widespread adherence among most people. Most, I think we saw during the pandemic. Here's what people don't like. They don't like shortages. They don't like being able to go to the store and not find what they want. Uh, they don't like that kind of chaos. So to think that as a society, as a global civilization, we're going to sell for no. There's only only there's only one way, and that's forward, and that's creating more prosperity, more wealth, and a greater ability to deal with big problems, whether it's the climate or pandemics. So you've identified a number of them over the course of that answer, but who exactly are today's enemies of progress, and how do they use the regulatory state to, or how does the regulatory state? Uh, impede progress through overregulation. Well, I think they manifest in a couple of different ways. People, here's how you can identify them. If when they hear about these advances in AI, if the one of the first things they say is either it will kill us or it will take all our jobs or it will take all our jobs and then kill us, that's an enemy. That's a, that's a downwing en- enemy of upwing progress. That's how you. That's how you can know them. If they are still saying we can't have nuclear power because of because of nuclear waste or it's just too dangerous, um, that even though you know you have countries which are shutting down reactors, having to go back to coal, which I thought was bad, bad for us, to me that is a sign. That somebody is a downwing enemy of upwing progress. If their basic theory is, but any new advance, any, any new technology is guilty until proven innocent, that is a downwing enemy. And again, you can find these people on the left. Unfortunately, too many environmental groups uh, would would qualify. But also, you have people on the right. Who, again, seem to echo. It seems to be talking about a lot of similar things. Very, they're talking. When they talk about AI. They talk about oh, the job loss. It's going to disrupt the community. Uh, that is their go-to. They don't think. They don't think like, gee, uh, I can see how that would that that might change jobs. But maybe the jobs would be better. Maybe the jobs would be better paying. Maybe there'll be new jobs making new things that will make our lives better. It doesn't. That argument. Uh, and you've seen a lot of that. You've seen a lot of that argument uh, in all the conversation about generative AI and Chat GPT. Um, and I and I've been I, I was I was kind of hoping that when the, when that technology really emerged uh, about a year ago, that we wouldn't hear these arguments about boy, it, we it might as well, it might as well be nineteen seventies 
and Three Mile Island, and we can never build another reactor. The, the, the argument and the attitude has not changed uh, in a half century. And I don't want another half century of that. And you shouldn't either. So you have an entire chapter on this in the book, but what are some of the downwing myths about economic growth? I want you, I want everyone to buy this book, but I tell you, these myths, you just read the New York Times or unfortunately a lot of other papers, you see them constantly. Um, that wage growth in this country has been flat for a half century. Uh, that wh why should we worry about making workers more productive? It won't, it won't affect their pay. Uh, Upward mobility, we're going to be worse off than our parents. Really, money doesn't really affect poverty. What is it? it doesn't really help us. It's very materialistic. We're running out of we're running out of earth. We we use we use five earths and we only have one earth. All this stuff, and I and I just give I just give the data is wrong. But it's part it's part of the fabric of this myth, which is, and you see how it plays sort of in a broader way which is like if, if if you're making the case that te that technology companies and I you know and I do have a whole chapter on policy and letting the world strivers come to this country that's good for economic growth then you have to start making the case that economic growth doesn't matter or never exists or we can't do it uh that you know that is totally that is totally false and I see these myths repeated over and over and over, uh, and I guess I'll have to keep responding to them uh, over and over, uh, probably until my dying day. Hopefully not. Hopefully, hopefully it won't be the case, and my book will be that powerful as a, as the as the myth bust those myths um, completely. But again, and the point, my point is, it really isn't that like that. There's been zero progress in the past half, half century. That would be wrong. But my gosh, I mean. It could be so much. We would have to worry about climate change because we'd already be doing clean energy. We would. We'd already have universal vaccines. We'd already uh, be mining asteroids for resources. All this, stuff, all this stuff, which seems like science fiction. All we needed to do was grow as fast, be as productive, and have the level of pr progress that we thought we would have fifty years ago, and we didn't get. Well. Time to get it. Well, one thing that you bring up in the book uh, that's a very vivid uh, example of some of these things you've been talking about is the anti kathira mechanism. Well, what was that and what can <laughs> we learn from the example of the Greeks? I hope I pronounced it right. Um, in order to avoid uh, yeah. another major uh, I, I technological the, delay. Uh, anti kathira um, uh, it actually, unbelievably enough, played a played a key role. Spoilers in the latest Indiana Jones movie. Uh, it was pulled out of the ocean uh, in the Greek islands about 120 years ago, and it didn't look like much. But over the years, as scientists poked at it and we had better imaging equipment, they realized that it was this fairly advanced astrological device which they could use for keeping track of the seasons, when there should be another Olympic Games. They, it's been called the first computer. And it's not a digital computer, but an analog computer. And what's interesting is that it sort of disappeared from history. And it, we were not able to reproduce that level of technology for like a thousand years. So I just began thinking, boy, what like, what if what if what if that hadn't been lost from history? Like where where would we be today? Um, you know how much you know we would have that sort of Star Trek uh, future probably already. And the reason I, I bring that up is that throughout throughout history, there's been all these detours and reversals where today we could be healthier and wealthier and be and if we have a comet coming toward us, knock it out out of its way. We should already be able to do that. And one of the key reasons that over and over throughout history is that some people have been anti-progress because they fear it will change their lives. They fear it will change their jobs. The people who are the winners fear they may not be the winners anymore. I mean, the Luddites are, are, are sort of the, the, the classic case, but throughout history, you can find examples of innovators coming up with new ideas, but they weren't the ones in power. 
the people in power did not want the change. They feared the change more than perhaps the eventual benefits of the change. And that's why you have this great combination of sort of democracy and capitalism and progress in the 19th century when people began to have more of a say. And people began to think, we like the progress. We like what it's, we like what it's giving us. Uh, and if, if you don't give us that progress and we can't also win wars because other people have the progress, that's bad too. Uh, instead of siding with the incumbents, governments began siding with the innovators who are making lives better, producing wealth, and also making them more military capable. So, so we, so that those early days of the industrial revolution, we saw that change. And today, still, the enemies of progress. You see, you see it with driverless car, driverless cars all the time. Uh, I was just reading an article about the expansion of driverless trucking in Texas, and why not California? Because the unions are more powerful out there and they fear the loss of those drivers. So even today, you'll see the exact same people wearing more up-to-date clothes, uh, worried about the impact of progress on their livelihoods. And that's fine. And those people are always going to worry, but the rest of us shouldn't give in. And I don't want to see the rest of us give in because we are unable to envision a better future. You continuously describe throughout the book one of the reasons for the Industrial Revolution and for so many other uh, breakthroughs in the past as an ability to think about the future in a positive way, a belief in the future. In the case of stagnating societies today, how much of a factor do you think an inability to properly think about the future is to a lack of growth or development? Well, if you've lived your whole lives during a period where growth has been, there's been economic growth, but it's been slow. So slow, there might not even seem like there's been any growth. And if you, and you ask a lot of people, they think, wow, you know, I, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not any better off. Maybe my family's not any better off than, maybe I'm not better off than my parents. This growth has been slow. So one, they haven't experienced it. And two, they're they're constantly reinforced with images about what progress means that seem negative. I mean, it should it be any surprise that the go-to example for AI is the Terminator? That, that you that's where it's gonna come. That it's gonna be Skynet and robots, and they're gonna kill it. That is by that is the and if there might be other sort of metaphors, but I'm pretty sure they're all negative as well. What and but I, I can't blame people because you know what? We don't have any positive images. We have so few. That certainly seems like we don't have any positive images. And that used to not be the case. One of the great, one of the great things I would like to, you know, return to is that, you know, these notion of world's fairs. World's fairs used to be places where people would see new technologies, be able to see them up close and what and what what they could do. That was not uncommon. I mean, you had whole world fairs which seemed to be devoted to the notion of progress. You think of the uh, the Futurama exhibit, I think, of the 1964 New York World's Fair, which uh, was the which was a leading exhibit where people did a. It was like a ride, and it was like a 20 minute ride through a, through the world of tomorrow, and it had all the classic like stereotypes, you know, undersea cities, colon space colonies, just you know, you know, soaring cities. So people saw, oh, this is what we're trying to, this is what we're trying to get at. This doesn't look scary. This looks awesome, but we don't do that anymore. So it's almost hard to ask people to take risks and accept the disruption that economic growth brings. Because fundamentally, economic growth is about change, change for the better, but it's still change. You have to ask people to tolerate that, and they're not going to tolerate it so easily. They think it's fundamentally not going to make their lives better. Maybe it'll make their lives way worse. It's easy to say people should be more open to change, but what do you tell someone who fears that technological change could lead to them becoming unemployed in their career or could destroy the economy of their hometown or something uh, that could really affect their lives like that. 
people need to believe that and need to believe factually that it's all worth it. That the change that comes with economic growth, which fundamentally will be driven over the long term by being more innovative and through technological progress, those are the fundamental drivers of economic growth and higher living standards that one, I, I, I can adapt, that I can adapt to that change. Uh, and right now I think people feel like they're on their own, right? So they feel like, you know, if something happens, like I'll never be able to like uh, work in this new sector. AI, I don't, you know, what I don't, what I got to work in AI now. So they, they need to believe that they can and that there will be programs to train them. And again, it, there's, there are going to be people who are, whose lives may get made, made worse. That's, I mean, I can't promise a, a sort of a, a society where nobody is ever worse off. And then they have to believe like, this would be a better world for my children too. It'd be a better world for my children if we don't have pandemics. It'll be a better world for my children that everyone in the world is so busy raising their living standards that they're we're not going to have a, we're not going to be worried about war because these economies are going to be growing so quickly that that's what people are going to be focusing on. They need to think that oh, uh, we will make the world safer. I don't have to worry about climate change. I don't have to worry about killer pandemics. I don't have to worry about asteroids. That I have made I what am I what I'm doing today will make the world safe for that future. Um, so so that, so that's what we have to get across. I mean, one of my what I think a lot about, and I, I this kept popping back into my head as I was writing this book. This notion of the doomsday clock. You know about this, the doomsday clock, which was a cold, it started in the Cold War, and it was supposed to tell us how close we were to midnight or absolute nuclear destruction. Since then, and it's still around. Now it's nuclear destruction and it's ai killing us and it's pandemics and it's inequality and it's it's like everything i would i don't want a doomsday clock i want like a genesis clock the, the, how close are we to a period of amazing progress how are, are, are we and how would you judge that you know and i give some criteria like are we reducing the number of people in extreme poverty how close are we to creating energy sources that are clean and abundant and cheap? I create all these criteria. How, how close are we to like dawn, not midnight? I mean, thinking that way about possibilities rather than the constraints. I think you have a very different society, a society more likely to make those achievements happen. So that mindset is the goal, but how do we get there? How do we nurture a culture that is truly an upwing culture and build an upwing economy? So so I think the cultural part is actually it is important. And I, I, I and I I hope that some of some of the ideas of you know whether it's whether it's my Genesis clock or it's world fairs or you know maybe investigate some big exciting inspirational projects. I mean, we did Apollo. I don't know. I mean, maybe we should think about trying to build a space elevator, one of these, you know, you know, you know, where we could just get things off the earth by basically going up an elevator to orbit. You know, maybe it's not possible. I think big ideas and invest, those are extremely inspirational. But listen, I work at a think tank. Uh, I'm going to talk about actual policies. And I think, I think I think again a lot of what went wrong is really sort of policy related. So I give I mean I won't go I won't go through them all you know all here, but I think when thinking about like what should we do, you have to think about like what is the purpose of an economy? And the purpose of the an economy is to turn dreams into reality. And the way we do that is by bringing smart minds together in ways that they can connect with each other and then the ideas they can come up with they can make them happen so you're talking about lots more money into r d thinking hard about the kind whether regulations make in of every policy a government does someone should be saying is this make it easier or harder to innovate that that i mean that may not be the only factor but if you're not making that one of the factors uh, listen, I, economic openness, sorry, sorry, populace, that's good for growth. 
you know, letting strivers, smart people, talented people come to your country where they can make do great things. Great Elon Musk quote that there's no better place in the world to make to, to make your dreams come true than the United States. That's important. We should remember that. So I go through a number of policies on immigration and uh, uh, the labor market, all that great stuff. Uh, but I think what's more important than policies is thinking about what we want those policies to accomplish. And what we want them to accomplish is connection, ability ability for people to connect, their ideas to connect, uh, to create the kind of economy that allows us to create the kind of world we want. And I want to be very clear. This isn't about, yeah, again, the uh, the minute, the, you know, the uh, the uh, Department of Progress, the Department of the Future in Washington, handing out their five uh, their five year plans. It's about giving each of us the tools we need to create the future that we want. And I think collectively, if we're all doing that, we're going to come up with something pretty good. So speaking of that role of people connecting to make progress, one part of the book that I really liked um, because it because I just wrote a book about progress in cities is when you describe the role of outstanding. Cities you are an outstanding in book. Don't don't be shy. It's an outstanding <laughs> you. book. You write an upwing future depends on getting the most possible out of our cities. It always has. Urban economist Edward Glazer has explained that these dense agglomerations that dot the globe have been engines of innovation since Plato and Socrates bickered in an Athenian marketplace. And to study them is to study nothing less than human progress. What policies can we implement to help our cities thrive and increase that economic mobility and opportunity that you were talking about and also help young people afford homes more easily and banish that myth of economic decline for the next generation. There used to, a few years ago, maybe now, I think it was the, uh, the, uh, maybe it was a 2004 election. One of the, one of the things I, I you know, a, one of the Republican catchphrases was I think drill baby drill. Uh, I think build baby build is good. Sometimes the simple econ 101 answer is the, oftentimes it is the answer and make it easier to build in these cities. Listen, we're not forcing people to move to cities if they don't want to go to cities. But for people who do want to, they should be able to move to these cities, uh, find affordable places to live, affordable enough that the income gains from moving to these high productivity, high wage cities aren't completely eaten up. And then this is going to be more of a state and local issue than a national issue. But it's boy, it, I, I I didn't say it, but housing does seem like the everything problem. If you're worried about inequality, if you're worried about faster economic growth, uh, if you're worried about wage growth, all these things come down to our our our, our these productivity engines not operating the way they should. And when you begin to look at all these you know all these bottlenecks to growth, cities, uh, you know you know inefficient uh, R&D, which I talk about, these regulations. You start looking at like the best estimates we have of how they could boost growth. You begin to see some big numbers. I mean, we have you know, a, a $20, $25 million economy, depending on how you want to figure it. Listen, we should have a $50 million. Imagine if we had a $50 million economy. What would we do with an extra 25, I, I, a trillion, I may have been saying million, trillion. What would we be doing with an extra $25 trillion? Uh, I, I, I think we'd give some back to the people. We'd pay off some debt. And boy, I think we'd do some amazing things and creating, you know, just an, an absolutely more amazing country. Now, most of the book is about creating the kind of environment that will allow us to progress. But you do give some ideas of what sort of technologies we might be able to look forward to in an upwing future. Could you uh, paint a, a vision for our podcast viewers and listeners of where we could be right now if we weren't getting in our own way? It does, it's, it seems science fictional to talk about getting energy from orbiting solar collectors or taking one shot and never getting any virus ever again, uh, mining asteroids, Elon Musk, multi-planetary civilization, being able to get from New York to 
uh, you know, Paris in 35 minutes. Um, and yes, of course, the uh, the autonomous electric flying cars, all those things. Again, those are just, ex those are, ex I, th I bet the coolest things that we would create with a more technologically advanced, richer world are, are ones we haven't even thought of yet. Those are just like what I you know what I've thought of with what science what science fiction authors have thought of, but that's that's just like a taste I think of what we could create. Um, to to imagine often again oftentimes when we think about we you know again it's sort of like we where's where the flying cars, but the fact that we could have a an asteroid pop up out of nowhere. And devastate the planet like that. Like we should be thinking hard about that. Like why aren't we spending more time on that? And we and NASA is doing more. But that I mean, if I was running for president, that would be a, that that might be on my top five list um, of of things I, I'd want to focus on. But to have the resources, that's one thing we really should have learned during the pandemic. To have the technological capabilities, it is super helpful to be a rich, technologically capable country. No matter what the problem is, whether it whether it's the climate, whether it's you know some pandemic or anything else, it it, it gives you the options to solve problems, even unknown unknowns. In this book, you very clearly set out what you see as the problems and the ways that we can overcome those problems, including. Uh, problems that may arise in the future, but how hopeful are you that humanity will ultimately embrace this upwing vision and achieve this sci-fi future? You know, I, I wasn't hopeful when I wrote, I started writing the book. <laughs> I was not very hopeful at all. I'm more hopeful now. And when you look around, I see things like this nuclear renaissance. That's a big, that's almost, I mean, if you're going to talk about what went wrong and what sort of encapsulates everything what, that went wrong, you would talk about nuclear power and the rejection of nuclear power. But I mean, that is obviously changing, uh, not in this country, across Europe, where they are, re, where they're going to build new reactors, recommissioning reactors. Uh, and for that to also happen after a nuclear disaster in Japan, which people thought like, that's it. If you had any hopes of there being a nuclear renaissance, it ain't going to happen. Well, it's even happening there. I think that to me, it's hard to like do a poll about people's views of technology, but that's a great stand in. Like, what do you think? Are you more fearful about nuclear power or do you focus more on what it could bring us? So I think that's that's great, great news. And says it says a lot. I think about my friends on the left who ta are talking about the abundance left or supply side liberal who are talking about creating a more productive. Now, I may not agree at all ways they want to do it, but to be thinking that way, how to make our America more productive, that's 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 fantastic. And of course, listen, uh, the, the sort of the China thinking about China and wanting to compete with China and not wanting China. Just imagine that when that news came out about chat GPT, when that was introduced. If that had been a Chinese company. Rather than an American company, we this would be a Sputnik moment. And we would be in a panic. So I think fear, I think that fear of losing that right, the AI race, uh, I think is also a sort of a, a tailwind here. You conclude the book with a very touching letter to the people of the future at the tricentennial 2076. If you could just sum up what you'd like to say to people then or even further in the future. Um, in case someone from the future watches this video too at some point or listens to this podcast recording, what message would you hope to convey to them? I hope I can congratulate them <laughs> that <laughs> that you did it, like that you did not let the negative images, that you did not let the people saying we can't do that. There's not enough Earth. Uh, capitalism is bad. Uh, uh, it won't work that the naysayers didn't win. They didn't win that. The people who are like, we're going to take a risk. We are an entrepreneurial risk-taking country. That's how you move forward. That's what we did. So I, I hope that is what I can say to them is like, congratulations that in 2076, the, the, the America of the tricentennial is far beyond what the America of the bicentennial even could have imagined. 
I hope I hope I hope that's what it is. And I, I, I hope I can deliver that message in person. And I hope that your prediction and the letter in the book that uh, your book becomes a bestseller and you're able to build a Tony Stark dream I, mansion. I hope all of that. Comes I was being through. humble. Let's make I was it being happen. humble. Right. Let's let's make it happen. <laughs> Buy his book. It's really, really a good read. Thank you so much for talking with me, Jim. Thanks so much for having me on.